Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome to the uh, policy luncheon of the National Hispanic Medical Association and the Hispanic Dental Association annual Hispanic Health Conference. How's it going so far? I, uh, I know we've had a lot of different activities and I want to just emphasize a couple things for our speakers. We actually went to Capitol Hill on uh, Thursday and met with uh, some, you know, 15, 20 offices and our doctors and dentists and students that went were asked to start writing some bills, start, start having more congressional briefings, be more proactive. And they were very, very excited to hear some of our ideas. And we have focused on committees of jurisdiction that work with the programs that we all work with, prevention, medical education, dental education, research, uh, the importance of the Affordable Care Act, the importance of, of, of having patient safety and really focusing on not only patient-centered care, but family-centered care. And these are just some of the policies that we all care about. So to hear an update of what's happening from the inside, our stakeholders today that are speakers are expert speakers from their own perspective of policies that impact the health of Latinos, whether they're oral health policies, medical health policies, and other policies, but it gives me great pleasure. I'm going to in introduce and have each speaker talk, and then we'll have questions afterwards. And we're here till 1.30. And I just want to remind everybody to please fill out evaluations. It's very important for our organizers, and I want to thank all the organizers for, for knowing uh, how you think, what you think about the, the content and the speakers. And I also want to thank all the staff and all the organizers uh, for this year's conference. So let me start with our first speaker from Congress, Melanie Anna Egorin, who has a PhD in medical sociology from UC San Francisco. She has her master's in public health from Emory in Atlanta, Georgia. And she's been on the Ways and Means Committee of Congress uh, with the Subcommittee for Health which means they focus on ish, uh, uh, policies that we're really concerned about. She's been in Congress for seven years, and before that she was with the GAO office developing research for Congress. Melanie, uh, we're very happy to have you. Hi. Welcome to the DC area, and thank you guys for allowing me to come and share a little bit about what is happening at Congress. Um, so now I have to lay out the ground rules because I am a congressional staff member. First, these are my comments as Melanie and Igorin. They do not necessarily reflect what Chairman Neal, the Ways and Means Committee, or the Democratic Caucus believe. The other is this all needs to be on background and sort of a conversation for me to help you understand what's happening in Congress, but I ask that you not post anything I say on social media or say the, you know, the, con the congressional staffer or anything, because if not, they won't let me leave my building, which is really sad. It's beautiful. For you, those of you guys who visited on Thursday, they are gorgeous buildings, and it is a privilege to work there, but I like being able to leave and engage with stakeholders. Or worse, I won't have my job on Monday, and I love my job. Like, I have my dream job, and I want to be able to keep my dream job. So if that's an okay sort of set of ground rules, Melanie Gorin's opinions, background for you guys. If you have additional questions or want to talk um, afterwards, I would love to continue to do that. So the best thing that's happened to me personally in the past six months is the Democrats took back the majority. It also means that I am spending a lot more time, which is good, thinking about health policy and what it means to be in a position where we can make change and we can sort of drive towards more universal, affordable health care for all Americans, which is an interesting political arena to have that conversation, given that Democrats control the House, Republicans control the Senate, and there is a Republican in the White House. So it's 
True bipartisanship is going to be the only way we are going to move forward an agenda for the next at least two years. The Ways and Means Committee on earlier this week passed a package of drug transparency bills to begin getting to address what is happening in terms of drug pricing, but also not just from a manufacturing perspective, but also from the PBM perspective, from a perspective of samples, which does impact many of you who are providers. And part of it is just understanding what is happening out there. The last time that Democrats were in charge was almost a decade ago. We passed this really, what I personally think was a great piece of legislation, which is the Affordable Care Act. But it continues to need to be strengthened and improved. That is one of the four priorities for the committee this year. We, the chairman, so Chairman Neal, with Chairman Pallone from Energy and Commerce, and Chairman Scott from Education and Labor, introduced a bill last month that puts forward sort of democratic priorities for strengthening the Affordable, uh, the Affordable Care Act, building on the gains we've made in coverage, but working towards making coverage more affordable making sure that the health insurance marketplaces are more stable, and making sure that consumers have the right information to select the best health care for themselves and their families, which is really an important thing that we've seen over the past 10 years. The other area that the Ways and Means Committee is focusing on in a health space is on surprise billing, which means two things. So the first is network, in network and out of network bills. When a patient comes, or as we would describe them, when a constituent calls and says, I don't understand why I just got a bill for $5,000. I did what I was supposed to do. I called the hospital and I made sure they were in network. I called my doctor and made sure they were in network. Right? This should have all been covered. But because of some, a referral pattern or some doctor that I didn't know I was going to need because most patients go into a care setting not knowing exactly the kind of care they're going to need at the end of the day, they have come in with surprise bills. So we're looking at that. The other thing we're looking at is what are the barriers to care for many Americans, which are high deductible, high out-of-pocket costs. And that's the second kind of surprise billing. Those are people, one of the 181 million Americans who have employer-sponsored insurance, who don't utilize health care that frequently. Maybe two years ago when they went to see the doctor, it was a $20 copay, and now their deductible is $1,000. So they go, right, they're paying their health insurance premiums, their employer's paying their health insurance premiums, and then they go to that doctor because they have an ear infection, or they have a staph infection on their elbow, or something small that two years ago would have been a $20 copay, and now they're bearing the full cost. So how do we make it so that people have affordable access to health care? Because what we don't want to do is create any further barriers to care than already exist, right? Getting to see a provider, one takes people being able to get there, so there are transportation barriers, there are affordability barriers, and there's also just the cultural barriers of like, is this enough to get to the doctor? and trying to figure out how to make sure we are making, removing as many barriers as possible that we can do through a policy lens, but also making sure we're working in partnership with the healthcare community to address additional barriers to care. The last thing the committee is focusing on is social determinants of health, which sounds like, for me, as the medical sociologist who's been doing this for 25 years, is like, oh, I'm really glad everybody's came to the conversation that many of you have been having for many, many years, right? People are like, did you know there are reasons people don't use healthcare? And I'm like, yeah, yes. Wait, you didn't? You didn't realize there was language. You didn't realize there was trust with providers. You didn't realize there was knowledge of what is an appropriate way to utilize healthcare, because that is culturally different. Um, the healthcare community is sort of finally getting there. People outside of those of you who have really been working to expand access within communities that have been traditionally underserved, who have been working to address language barriers and cultural barriers and just health education and health literacy barriers, other people are starting to come to that conversation. They're starting to look at utilization and health disparities in a new light. And it's a really fun time for me as somebody, as I said, who's been doing this for a long time to engage in that conversation. But I think that's a place where we need 
all of the different communities, all of the providers and the patients and the payers and the community organizations like community health centers, but also our large academic medical centers that are training our doctors, our dentists, our pharmacists, our nurses. All of us need to be having a conversation about how to make sure our healthcare system are treating people in a way that is culturally appropriate, but also is respectful of cultural differences. Um, so that, and that's very nuanced and that's hard, but it's something that I think will make our healthcare system stronger and go a long way to addressing the issues around accessibility and access, right? Making sure people have a doctor who, or a nurse or a dentist or a pharmacist who is a trusted provider and understands that where they are coming from, what are those barriers to care are different than what they may have been trained as right, when they, were back, when they were in medical school or dental school or pharmacy school. So that's sort of the, what Ways and Means is talking about. I'm gonna now give you my plug on like, please engage with your local, local elected officials. I'm thrilled you guys came to the Hill. It's, I love fly-ins, that's what we call them when you guys come and you get to go see what we do and you understand, um, one, that the food is not very good in the basement of the Longworth building. How many people had to eat in the Longworth cafeteria? Because I eat there like four times a week. And remember, I went to grad school in a hospital, like, right? I mean, I had like the bare minimum like standard for what food should taste like. And I still am like, oh, I long for the days of the UCSF cafeteria. So, okay, so you get to see that part of our life, but you also get to see that there's a small, committed group of people that really want to make a difference. The Ways and Means staff, which has jurisdiction over all of Medicare, including graduate medical education, the Affordable Care Act, all health taxes, Social Security, right, trade and some other stuff, but the health team, there are four of us. My colleagues at Energy and Commerce, which also have all of the things in the Public Health Service Act, so FDA, right, as well as Medicare, they have Medicaid. There are less than 10 of them. We work really, really hard, but we rely on stakeholders to tell us what they need, but also to help educate our members. So please get to know your local elected officials. It's great you came to DC, but go to their town halls, meet their district office, invite their district staff to come to your healthcare facility or to your meeting. It makes it more meaningful for us on the Hill when we think about issues. It makes it more meaningful for members when they have been there. Um, my, one of my very first bosses on Capitol Hill when I started working for him had gone home and gone to a community health center. That community health center had been in his district for a very long time. He had visited multiple times, but he was starting to see what a new infusion of funding <coughs> meant to them. And then he came back and he was like, so wait, transportation, let's have a conversation about transportation. I had another member who used to represent downtown Los Angeles who came back and said, do you know there are 120 languages spoken in my district? And I went, I do now. What do we do about that? Right? Like downtown LA is a great place. It's a vibrant place. But he heard from his providers that they had to be able to speak Hmong and Korean and four dialects of Spanish and Eritrean, right? And English. And how do you provide care that meets all of those needs in a community that had low provider volume? So talk to your members, invite them in, get to know the district staff, write constituent letters. I know that sounds crazy, but we keep track of those. One of the big reasons the Affordable Care Act is still here is because people were engaged and they shut down phone lines into Republican offices. So if there is something that is important to you, pick up the phone, write the letter, get to know the district staff so when you call, they're like, oh yes, I remember meeting you or coming to your facility. So I'm gonna wrap up there and let the other speakers talk to you about their view of Capitol Hill, and then please ask any kind of questions you want. Thank you, Thank you Melanie. That was a great overview from our Ways and Means Committee. Next, we have a speaker representing a different part of healthcare policy. Melissa Bishop Murphy is D Senior Director of National Government Relations and Multicultural Affairs 
for Pfizer, Inc. Uh, prior to joining Pfizer, and I think it's important to understand how people get to where they get, and, and the exper wealth of experience that you have to get to certain high-level positions, like our speakers today. Prior to joining Pfizer in 1998, you've been there a long time, yeah. Melissa worked as general counsel for the Georgia Department of Medical Assistance, which is their Medicaid agency. So she comes from a, a vast experience of working with poor people and programs that help our communities in the South. She went to college at Stillman College in Alabama, and she received her JD from Georgetown University Law Center. And she's, a, she's very active in her community. And I want to say we've been uh, colleagues for a long time. Pfizer was probably the very first sponsor of NHMA. We did a Latino video that won awards for Pfizer. And uh, we were very happy to be part of the very first Latino advisory committees to a major corporation in this country when we started the organization in 1994. And uh, I think that it's, it, it's a testament to Melissa's vision and leadership and all the team at Pfizer to see the value in working together with us. So anyway, Melissa. Good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Rios. Uh, I remember when I came to Washington, D.C. to uh, work in our federal office, uh, office, one of the first persons I met was Dr. Rios. And so we have been working together, frankly, almost my entire 20, almost 21 uh, year career with Pfizer. So thank you for the partnership, Dr. Rios. And I'm just thrilled to see NHMA grow. Now we have the chapters, and so we're active in the on the state level as well. So you guys should give yourselves a round of applause. Now let me see, so. Uh, I won't be long, so I will make myself an agenda. I would love to talk to you a few minutes about the Pfizer RS Pathways Program. Uh, then there are two policy issues I want to delve into, and then talk a little bit about the power of advocacy, although, Melanie, you have stole my thunder. <laughs> so the things that I was going to talk about, you've already had. So but I just I will talk short, a little bit about that. So the Pfizer Arts Pathways Program, you should have information at your table about that, the Pfizer Arts Pathways Program. It is our drug donation program that provides Pfizer medications for free or at reduced cost. We were uh, thrilled when the Affordable Care Act passed, thinking that finally everybody would have access to their medicines and we wouldn't need the Pfizer Arts Pathways Program. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So please take this information and share with your patients, your constituents, your friends and family. We will continue to have this program as long as people don't have access to their medications. So thank you for helping us spread the word about the Pfizer X Pathways Program, and we want people to use it. So take a card. Oh, I want, also want to say, I, one of the uh, uh, feedbacks that we get around the, our drug donations program is, look, it's really hard to go through the process. Our uh, drug, uh, our application process is uh, front and back, just uh, two pages. We don't ask about immigration status. Uh, and it's a toll-free number that you can call to uh, apply for, or you can go on the website. So it's a very simple program. We have this uh, available 24-7, and we have uh, Spanish-speaking uh, people on the other end of the uh, line. So the two issues I would like to spend a few minutes on are drug importation and ACIP uh, recommendations around pneumococcal pneumonia. So let's talk about drug importation. So I want to make it clear. Pfizer does not, uh, our position is that we, we are okay with drug importation as long as it's regulated by the FDA and that there is a regulated distribution channels. So I, I, as you gave your disclaimer, Melanie, that is our disclaimer. And you should have a sheet at your table again around the positioning around importation. Um, I, but we understand why 
um, Congress is looking at importation. People still aren't getting access to their medications, either because of, uh, mostly because of cost. But, and so we believe that there are other ways to uh, access your medication, the Pfizer RS pathways is one of them, but also uh, we applaud uh, the, the acts of Congress around uh, the PB, uh, PBM drug transparency legislation that recently came up that Melanie spoke about. Uh, our concerns with importation is safety. I think uh, most people when they get their medications for Canada think that that, that medication it has been uh, regulated or reviewed by um, the Canada system. We don't know what the distri distribution channel is, and, and we don't know how that medication came from Canada to the U United States. So we would urge all of you as uh, physicians, as healthcare providers, to send your patients through regulated FDA channels to get their medication. If they're having problems with getting their ma medication, let us know. Um, and because there is a way to get your medications without having to go through unregulated drug channels. And frankly, it's just, it's just not safe. Um, we have a counterfeit unit at Pfizer and uh, there have been a number of our medications from Lipitor uh, to Viagra, which is the most counterfeit, counterfeited medication in the world. Um, <laughs> so, so we want to make sure, we want to make sure everybody gets the real thing, okay? <laughs> so anyway. Uh, j just be mindful of that. Uh, really make sure that your patients uh, know that there are other ways to get their medication. So enough of that. So uh, another serious issue when we talk about access uh, for minority patients is this whole issue around vaccinations. Um, recently, um, there has been a, a potential recommendation to remove the pneumococcal vaccine recommendation by ASEP. And we are very concerned about that, especially from a disparities point of view. Um, you, you know, we are already dealing with, as, as minorities, dealing with access issues and disparity issues. Um, and so uh, there's been great strides that have been made around vaccinations or around pneumonia. I, I, I'm always surprised when I find out that y even young people are dying from pneumonia. Uh, I'm sort of, I follow pop culture, so I'm gonna make a P. Diddy reference here. <laughs> but uh, uh, you, uh, as you know, his, his uh, children's mom, very young age, uh, mid thirties, died from pneumonia. And you know, we talk about having walking pneumonia. It should not be happening. It should not be happening when we have a vaccine to prevent that. So, uh, and, and we definitely don't want it happening in, in our communities. I, I, I think I should want to share a statistic with you on, on the next slide. The goal from the um, uh, National Foundation for Infectious Diseases is that 90% of the population should be vaccinated for pneumonia. As you can see from the statistic, only 60% of the population is vaccinated against pneumonia. And unfortunately, only 43% of Hispanics have had their pneumococcal vaccination. So to remove this for the most vulnerable population, the 65 plus population, is something that we think is not, um, is not right for this population. So we urge you to consider um, uh, speaking up about this issue. The ACIP uh, committee is meeting in June in Atlanta, Georgia at, uh, at the CDC, and we would urge you to consider maybe uh, 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 sending in letters that are advocating to keep this recommendation, especially because this uh, change is really looking at cost and let's think about cost, if you will. Uh, in the U U.S. Con economy spends $7 billion a year for unvaccinated adults. And we're seeing that with the children. I mean, every time I turn the television on, it's, they're talking about a measles outbreak and, and, and what's going on in California and New York. We could have the same thing going on with this unvaccinated population around uh, pneumonia. Um, the cost for not vaccinating adults 
for pneumonia is 1.86 billion with a B dollars a year. So we uh, really would urge you to consider uh, engaging in this issue. So how, how can you play a role? Again, Melanie has already pointed out some really great things, but it really is to advocate. Advocate, advocate, advocate. And that advocacy can come through uh, letter writing, it can come through uh, tweeting, posting, uh, it can come through the or being a part of an organization like this. No matter how you advocate, I urge you to advocate. And there are a lot of issues to advocate for. Um, uh, the strengthening of the Affordable Care Act is something that uh, Pfizer is very supportive of. Uh, continuing to maintain the children's health insurance program, the CHIP program in your states, uh, it's been under attack. So uh, the CHIP program is another great area to advocate in. And also to support policies that support um, uh, are addressing the whole issue of the social determinants of health, whether it be around poverty, health literacy, low education, criminal justice reform. And I want to uh, say another kudos to Dr. Rios. I was at the National Medical Association meeting earlier this week, and I don't know if it was the first time, but it was the first time I've seen in 20 years that the American Medical Association the uh, National Medical Association, which is the African American doctors, and yours truly were on a panel t talking together how they can advocate collectively. And it was a really great thing to see, Dr. Rios. They, the, you did a wonderful job. But it was great to see the medical community finally come in and saying, I have a role to play in health advocacy. I have a role to play in health policy. Unfortunately, we always say if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so, unfortunately, doctors and medical professionals, you guys have been on the menu. The surprise billing that uh, Melanie has talked about, uh, um, step therapy that t stands in the way between what you, the prescriptions you work right and what actually is given to your patients. So, you guys, I'm so thrilled to see you now come together as uh, the um, medical community to advocate for your patients. Great job, continue to do that, and know that Pfizer stands with you, and we're here to help you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, one of our speakers from Congress was unable to make it uh, due to illness. So we have another perspective from another stakeholder group. Mr. or Dr. Tommy Harrison is the chairman of the American Dental Political Action Committee. He was born and raised in Texas, earned his doctor of dental surgery from Baylor College of Dentistry in Dallas, and his undergraduate degree from Texas Tech in Lubbock. He's got a master's in business, and let me just say that he has been very much involved in the leadership uh, for the country uh, for the American Dental Association and was one of the presidents, I'm not sure what year, but, but I know that you've been involved for a long time in leadership. And from his perspective, continuing to work with organized dental uh, organizations, moving from, from the administration and, and spokesperson role to really getting into the nuts and bolts of how to develop policy perspectives for dentists in this country, uh, which is what a political action committee leaders do. So here to tell us what are priorities for the dental community, Dr. Harrison. Thank you, Dr. Rios. <clears throat> uh, so, God, the speaker, other speakers were so uh, short, I guess I have like 30 minutes to talk. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding, Pedro. Just kidding. Uh, I'll try to stick to uh, the 15 minutes or so. Uh, my dental colleagues say, Tommy, you can't say any, you can't even get your introduction in, in less than 15 minutes. So I'll try to stick to the point. I do have a PowerPoint by the speaking points, but I wanted to start off by thanking my good friend, Anna Meunier, in the back, who happens to be standing up, Anna. Uh, Anna is program director of this of this uh, conference, and, and asked me several months ago to present here. Uh, and my topic is on dental priority policies, but I'm you know as ADPAC, we're we're more into uh, 
not, not so much policy as we are in getting the bills passed. Uh, and so uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the PAC end of it. I do serve, since I'm chair of the American Dental Political Action Committee, as a liaison to the ADA Council on Governmental Affairs, and that's really where the policy goes into effect. We have a board of trustees of the American Dental Association that definitely tries to add their political spin to the policy uh, workers, and then we have our ADA House of Delegates. It's really the ruling body of the American Dental Association that comes up with our policy. So I'm going to talk about several bills, if we could advance the slide to the next one. Uh, the first one is the McCarran-Ferguson reform. There we go. So this bill passed the 115th Congress, last Congress, with 416 votes in favor in the House of Representatives and seven votes against. So you talk about uh, reaching across the aisle and bipartisan uh, support. Uh, it, it was overwhelming, but uh, the a bill was never introduced into the Senate. And so this legislative session, the 116th legislative session, we have bills and there, there are bill numbers there with House sponsors on the Democrat and the Republican side and Senate sponsors on the Democrat, Democrat and the Republican side. And so this bill definitely affects all of dentistry and medicine. Uh, for the first time, uh, we have bicameral and bipartisan bills, uh, uh, and, and that's huge. And we, we have hope that in this legislative session that this bill is going to pass. So how will that affect medicine? Uh, the bill allows for the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice to enforce a full range of antitrust laws against health insurance companies. So you might wonder, well, why did, in 1945, the Congress pass the McCarran-Ferguson uh, bill that, that labeled antitrust uh, to take place in opposition to the Sherman antitrust bill that was passed in 1891. And so in 1891, in the late uh, 19th century, uh, when the Industrial Resolution was building up, there were companies and businesses and industries that would collude together and, and come up with price fixing uh, to make it to where the public wasn't getting the best deal. Uh, and so Congress, with their, in their infinite wisdom, passed a bill that said, you can't do that. You have to be transparent. You, you can't set fees amongst industries, and that's antitrust. And if you do, then the FTC will, will come, again, uh, come, come for you. Uh, and, but in the mid-40s, the insurance industry was very important that the indus, insurance industry took hold. So we're not talking about just medical and dental insurance. Dental insurance didn't even exist in the mid-40s. I'm not sure how big of a player medical insurance was, but health insurance, people were having more cars and automobiles at that time, not health insurance, excuse me, life insurance, uh, all types of insurance entities. And it was important that the industry, insurance industry succeeded and that they were able to uh, give affordable rates for people who wanted to buy insurance so that they could protect their businesses, because they could protect their lives. And so in this age of transparency, uh, in the year 2019, uh, it's the belief of the American Dental Association, and I would believe the American Medical Association as well, is we don't need so much. We want transparency. If the insurance companies are able to set our fees and collude with each other about how our care is being delivered, then that is not in the public's best interest. So it's not a provider bill. It's more of a public bill. And if we can compete on an even playing field, and this Sherman anti, or the McCarran-Ferguson reform can pass, then it'll allow insurance industries to compete once against one another, and the rates will go down. And so that's why we think that we have a good chance of passing this bill. And, and so, yes, you see the bill numbers. Those of you in the audience who have never participated in the political arena, great, great speakers before me have, have given you some hints as to how to get involved. And, and maybe in the questions that, and after you, you'll ask some questions about that as well. Because, yeah, we, that's, what, that's what I'm all about. Uh, I've been real involved on the local, state, national level on getting involved politically. And, uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there's ways to do it. In fact, this weekend is our fly, and it starts tomorrow, uh, April 14th through the 16th. La two years ago, we had 1,100, uh, 1,000 fly uh, uh, dentists and dental students from all across the United States 
Uh, last year we had 1,100 and we're expecting more this year. And so we have a great program uh, on Sunday, Monday, and then Tuesday will be our day on the Hill where we'll be talking about these three bills. The next bill is the Ensuring Last Smiles Act. Uh, uh, next bill, next slide, uh, or ELSA. And we can all remember ELSA. I, I, my had, my uh, grandchildren, first round of grandchildren, they're six years old now, were born during, uh, during the time of Frozen, and so I know all about ELSA. And so it's, it's easy, this is a good acronym, but it, it's, uh, it's Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. So he, one in 33 children that are born in the United States, or you know, around 3%, uh, are, in the U.S. are born with congenital anomalies or birth defects. Uh, the congenital an 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 anomalies can interfere with a child's ability to breathe, speak, and eat in a normal manner. These two bills would require group and individual health plans to provide medically necessary coverage for the treatment of congenital abnormalities and birth defects. So in reality, insurance companies, health insurance companies, are, are reluctant to pay for the first surgery that may occur at birth for children that are born with these uh, craniofacial deformities. And, but some, most of the time they'll pay for that first surgery because it's, it's, life, it's, it's, it's life or death. But any subsequent surgeries, they use a clause that says this is for cosmetic reasons only. And, and they reject and reject and reject and it takes a lot of effort on behalf of the uh, the, of the beneficiary of the insurance policy, of the uh, people who work for the hospitals, uh, it's, it, to maybe get some reimbursement. This bill would just hold the insurance companies liable or are responsible for their policies and make it a little bit more clear that these, we're not talking about uh, uh, cosmetic issues when we're talking about being able to breathe. And there's even a rider in this bill that says we're, we're not, we won't, don't want this to cover cosmetic uh, issues, but we want it to cover more of the basic surgical it. So that's just, it's not just for uh, a surgery, it's for inpatient and outpatient care and uh, for medical and dental. So it's a great bill. 25 states already have laws in some form that address this issue, but since it's not covered on a national level, then many times those bills don't really mean anything on the state level. So, uh, so this is a great opportunity to, to pass some legislation with that would affect our medical and dental patients as well. Something we can work together on. And then the next bill is the Student Loan Programs and Higher Education Act. Uh, the average debt of a graduating dental student uh, of the United States is $287,000. And so when they come out of dental school with this kind of a debt, uh, I mean, we're, this bill doesn't say we're gonna forgive your debt. It basically is two provisions, uh, 18, uh, 1554, H.R. 1554, is the READY Act would allow medical and dental students to qualify for deferment during a residency program and allow subsidized and unsubsidized loans to accrue interest-free during that time. Something that makes sense. It's not, you know, it's just, it's common sense. And so when we do our Hill visits uh, on Tuesday, we're gonna not be talking to legislators because they're back during their break between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, we'll be talking to legislative aides that deal with health care reform. And many, many times, those are the best people to talk to. They, they uh, 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 like Melanie was saying, they understand the bills sometimes uh, and the intricacies. And so we're, we're, we're really looking forward to the opportunity to discussing this bill. Uh, and then H.R. Uh, 2186 is a Student Loan Refinancing Act would allow individuals with federal direct federal direct plus and direct consolidation loans to refinance and take advantage of low interest hike rates and allow the rates to be fixed to protect them for future interest rate hikes. So right now, uh, graduates of dental school can refinance their loan. They just have one opportunity to do that. And so this would open it up a little bit more and it would apply to medical students as well. So some, some really good, simple legislation. This is not the first time we've introduced uh, any of these bills, we've done a number, so we work with our lobbying staff, with uh, uh, con Congress and, and legislative aides that deal with health care reform. It, it warmed my heart when Melanie was saying we we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of people, there's just 10 people that are involved with the House Ways and Means, uh, as far as staff, and the Energy and Commerce Committee, and so they get real familiar with our lobbyists. Uh, there are a couple other uh, issues of Indian Health Services and federal dental programs. 
but uh, I'm going to forego on that so we can have more time for questions. I would like to mention a big victory that we had this past year, a bill called Action for Dental Health. The bill was passed in 2018. So during our fly-in, around this time of 2018, March of 2018, this was one of the bills we were lobbying for. This was our third year in a row to lobby for this bill. This gives some of the uh, specifics on the bill that, that are on the, uh, the, uh, the overhead. But uh, the bill passed in 2018, and we're currently working with HRSA and CDC on next steps for implementation. This will take a while because this, you know, it's a three to five year cycle as far as funding. And, but for one specific, many of the states in the United States, in fact, Oklahoma right now is having a MOM project. MOM is the acronym for Mission of Mercy. And so uh, well over a thousand volunteer dentists and dental assistants and dental hygienists and, and uh, volunteers on the local level Yesterday treated a thousand patients. Today they'll treat a thousand patients. All the care is done free, and so it takes care of a lot of people uh, that that can't afford to go to the dentist on a regular basis. Not just extractions are done, although a lot of extractions are done. But there's uh, fillings, some root canals, even some prosthetic uh, dental appliances are delivered during this time. And so those uh, kind of mom projects cost anywhere from seventy-five thousand to a hundred thousand to put together as far as having uh, porta potties, police, uh, uh, feeding the volunteers, feeding the people that are having the services done. And so some of that money with a grant could be uh, applied to HRSA or the Center for Disease Control. That's just one of the pro programs that could be done. Uh, uh, we've definitely worked with the Surgeons General. Uh, there, there's a, the last report that had to do with oral health was in 2000. So the next one's gonna be coming out in 2020 and so many changes have taken place. Uh, oral health has evolved significantly since 2000. Uh, as an example, uh, medical and dental integration and collaboration have changed dramatically. Uh, caries management, the management of tooth decay. We now have silver diamine fluoride that can be placed just a drop on the tooth uh, and, and can arrest decay, that can keep decay from advancing. Uh, one of the side effects, unfortunately, is the tooth turns black uh, and so it's mostly done in posterior regions uh, where it's not an aesthetic concern, but uh, for elderly populations or children, that's a new advancement uh, that's just revolutionized the, the way we deal with dentistry. Uh, and uh, prevention and emerging service uh, science and chronic conditions and their relation to oral health or other areas that may be addressed in the forthcoming report. So as in conclusion, the ADA has a robust advocacy agenda and is, in, is focused on improving the oral health of the public as well as ensuring the practice of dentistry and the delivery of care continue to focus on patients. We have a robust scientific affairs division and last year adopted policy that aims to educate dentists and patients on the role of oral pharyngeal cancer and HPV and that was presented yesterday. There's a vaccine now that can be given to men and women children, adults, and females that will essentially prevent you from having H cancer related to HPV. So it's, the, the future is great for dentistry and medicine working together, and I, I really enjoy and appreciate this opportunity to present today. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for discussion, and it's very important to understand in Washington, D.C., and in your state governments, you have an opportunity to provide your input. And so if you could ask questions about to clarify uh, things that the speakers addressed, or if you have another comment or question, we'd be happy to have them answer. I just want to give one example of a new bill that on the medical side that happened in December that was actually passed into law. It's called the SOAR Act. S-O-A-R. Melanie, I don't know if you're familiar with that act at all, but one of our Hispanic congressmen, Tony Cardenas from the San Fernando Valley, was part of the uh, uh, team that introduced this bill. And he's been a longtime uh, proponent of juvenile justice and mental health for kids. And, you know, we don't think about mental health and physical health and oral health coming together. But they created a, a, a new law to give money to HRSA to train providers. You know, HRSA gives money to medical schools and dental schools for training a new curriculum. 
to train providers on those things that we think of that are in the criminal justice arena, sexual abuse, domestic violence, child abuse, and even human trafficking. So this is a new curriculum that's gonna be created into grants for, for the teaching, for teaching faculty who are here, think about that, or for researchers that are here. Just wanted, wanted to use that as an example. So get your juices going. Uh, we need you to ask some questions. We have two microphones right here if you wanna come up. And just identify yourself uh, for the speakers. And if you can just be brief in your, in your question. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Uh, Harrison, yes. thank you very much for your presentation and, and for the panel, but particularly in your work towards uh, funding uh, students. Um, this is one of my particular interests at this point. Lorraine, just, introduce yourself. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm Lorraine Gutierrez. I'm a family doctor in Southern California. And to kind of quantify what I'm saying here, I'm emerging from the dark cave of, and it's not a dark cave, but for 20-some years of raising kids and, and you know, making a home and that sort of thing. And so I'm, I'm eager now to be able to be active. But to my point, to the point that I want to make, I have two daughters, one's an engineer, one's going into medicine. The engineer is starting a PhD program at Carnegie Mellon, full play. She, she was able to get funding for her graduate studies all the way through PhD, no, no strings attached. So this is some kind of foundation that was, well, it was paired with industry. So I, my question, and the, the daughter's going into medicine, hello, <laughs> you know, it's going to be very expensive for her and for us as, as parents to, to help fund that education. So my question for everyone in the room, I guess, is where's the funding for the medical students and for the dental students? And, and so that's why I applaud you. Thank you very much. Is there anywhere in industry that, that is going to be, have an interest in pairing with, with educating without strings more and more diverse physicians and health, health workers in, in the field. Uh, do we see that coming down the pipeline? That's the question, thank you. Uh, so, uh, great question, uh, <laughs> not an easy answer. Uh, the, the reason that the average debt of a graduating dental student in the United States, when they graduate, like the, the class that's graduating now in 2019, in fact, these statistics go back, I think, to 2017. That that that, that figure is $287,000 for dental students, mm -hmm. is because dental education is very expensive. It's the most expensive education, and one of the reasons is is uh, dental schools are very expensive to build. Uh, it's you know we we're uh, uh, I, I'm not sure quite how it works in medicine because I didn't go to medical school, but uh, dental schools. An average dental practice, like my practice, it's like a mini hospital. I have compressors, suctions, uh, uh, digital x-rays. Uh, I have my own, everything that I need to operate is right there in my practice. Uh, and so dental schools have to train dental students to practice in my setting. And so they have uh, the, the technology alone, as far as IT and uh, the uh, the, to be able to use electronic records, uh, it, it costs uh, into the $200 million to build a dental school, and then the ongoing cost, just the electricity alone to run a dental school is like, it's just astronomical every day. And so the cost that the dental student has to pay, there are state Texas, there's three dental schools in the state of Texas now, uh, getting ready to be four. There's going to be a new dental school, University of T Texas Tech University in El Paso is going to have a new dental school that opens in 2021. Uh, so there's three, one in, there's three, two UT schools, one A&M school in Dallas, and Texas Tech is going to have one. They all compete for, with uh, the state for, uh, for money to help fund their dental schools, but they don't fund it 100%. So the dental schools have overhead that includes faculty. They have uh, all kinds of employees. Dental school education is very expensive. And so if you're a dental student and you're right at the top as far as GPA and DAT, the dental admissions test, then dental schools compete against each other and offer scholarships. Uh, when you uh, graduate from dental school, there's loans of certainly available uh, of different sorts. Uh, 
as I'm, I'm just starting, this is my first year on faculty at the University of Texas School of Dentistry, so I'm learning a whole lot more about the types of loans and which types you get in the, in the interest that you pay during that time is very critical. So that, that's some of the answers. Anyone else? Um, yeah, so I'm, my microphone's not working. So I'm going to use my big teacher it voice. It's working. Oh, it's working? It. Okay, sorry. I can't hear it back here. I won't use my big teacher voice. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I don't want to create moral equivalency between what it means as somebody with a PhD who got a PhD at a medical university, right? I mean, I was, went to an all academic medical campus to get my PhD. I don't want to create a moral equivalency of how much we are paying for PhDs versus how much we are paying for medical physicians and dentists and other terminal degrees. So first, let's remove that from the conversation because they there are different funding mechanisms, right? The funding for a PhD, unlike in coursework, and we can have this as a societal conversation, is paid for considerably through grants that come from the federal government, through the NIH, through various research arms. If we wanna pay academic medical centers to train students and count that as sort of almost a work study, that is an option that is a larger conversation. I don't want folks here to lose sight of the fact that Medicare pays for a large amount of graduate medical education as well as undergraduate, so medical school and dental school education and supporting a university. There is an additional payment that goes on to every Medicare beneficiary to pay for indirect medical education expenses. So we do recognize the cost of training our health workforce. There's also additional funding that was put in place last year by Congress for training, and this is not in the Ways and Means jurisdiction, so on behalf of my colleagues at Energy and Commerce, that goes into community training of physicians and nurses. So we do take that job, the members, you know, the sort of federal view of this, we do take this very seriously. We want to diversify. It is a partnership with states. There are many states that have seen this challenge of how do we diversify our health professions, but also how do we make sure that students don't graduate with a half million dollars worth of debt? I mean, it is overwhelming, and it, is, it does have health implications of who chooses to return to communities where healthcare is primarily paid for by Medicaid or Medicare. Like, we recognize that, and California right now is having a really robust conversation about this, it's a follow-on conversation to something they had 20 years ago around how to get individuals to train and return to underserved communities. There are states such as Tennessee and other states, I just talked about the Tennessee program, that provides this. And we also may need to look back to what was the role of the U.S. Public Health Service and how that plays into the role of training. Um, so not to be dismissive, but like, there is a large amount of federal support for this and in those state partnerships. Um, and there are other people quite, I, it's my first love was graduate medical <laughs> education. So like, you wanna talk about that? I'll talk after this. And, and, and I would add also that when I was general counsel of the Medicaid agency, we, the state of Georgia, and most states do provide for graduate medical education, but the point I think that where you don't see the trickle down to actually to your students is you, you have to advocate and lobby for that. So the money goes somewhere. Is it going trickling down to the students? That's the question. So make sure that you're at the cap, state capitals lobbying for that money to make sure it goes directly to pay for that education. So I, I really want to have that point because I just don't see um, us at the Capitol a lot advocating for this. Can I just add a question to this? Uh, if you can talk about loan repayment options for the healthcare community. I know we have the National Health Service Corps, but are there other loan repayments mechanisms? Um, so I, I think there, is a, there are places, there are this Health Service Corps, there are state level programs. Mm. We have been thinking about ways to relieve student debt for all American students. Um, and so I think ideas such as deferment while in residency, repayment for service within the state, um, you know, are there ways of dealing with it within the tax code, which is something that most people don't really think about, but right, how do we treat this in terms of calculations of income? There have been lots of 
conversations about how recognizing the burden of student loans, um, but there hasn't been a like, this is the perfect answer. Right. Um, and I do think it is a societal conversation about where is our investment and how much do we expect mm -hmm. for students to bear, for society to bear, and for the public programs to bear. Mm -hmm. And, and, and just in the legislative thing, that doesn't happen overnight, right? So when we talk about all of these legislative victories, so whether it's the SOAR Act mm -hmm. or whether it's passing dental, you know, additional dental benefits, it takes a long time, and I know that is frustrating to people that are like sitting out there, but there needs to be those conversations, there need to be the socialization, we mm -hmm. need to hear from stakeholders. What you don't want is something to be, you know, the smoky back room cooked up mm -hmm. where I think it's the right answer, but it might not be. So like mm -hmm. that airing and that having things out there, while frustrating, totally understand, I get frustrated too. It's really important for making sure the policy is crafted in a way that is as correct as possible and serves as many Americans as possible. Next question. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Gladys Maestre. I'm from University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. And uh, I'm going to make this question to Dr. Gore, um, particularly because I see a lot of Latinas in the audience, and particularly young Latinas. I was very distressed by your request of not um, sharing uh, the social media, of course, it is your right, but that was not the part that distressed me, it was the, I don't know if it was a joke, but were you, are you afraid of retaliation, that your comments get social? So, oh, okay, that's, that's it, it's, it is a joke. I probably yeah, will not yeah. get fired for anything I say <laughs> right, here. Okay. But it is something that I take very seriously. So it's not retaliation, and I thank you, and I under, it is not retaliation, okay. but, no, I, this is it. one of the things as a congressional staffer you don't want, right? It is the work of my boss. I play a support role. I am very proud of my professional accomplishments. I'm very proud of my work. But I am not the person that got elected to Congress. I don't have a certificate of election. I am not the person that stands on the House floor and has to vote and go back to my constituents and say, this is why I voted to raise your taxes or lower your taxes, to take away a benefit or to add a benefit. So I don't want to speak on behalf of the people that have to go make, who have to stand in front of their constituents. I do the policy work. I love my job. I really do. Um, it makes me super happy. And I like the policy work. I like working with stakeholders. But it's not mine to defend the policy. It is not mine to say why a member would or would not vote on an issue or what they want to bring to the table. I am more. I don't want to say technical person, right? It's like the, right. but it, it, and it's a fine balance. It's a weird balance. Like, trust me, it's a weird thing to be in D.C. and have to even say that. But it's something that I am very sensitive to. And I do have colleagues who, when their name comes up in the New York Times or in the Washington Post or the local paper, have had to go to their bosses and explain why. So it's just the ground rules of its own background. We just sort of. It's convention for congressional staff. My name is Pablo Vigil from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Family Medicine. Uh, I was told yesterday that the CEO of United Healthcare makes $200 million a year. <laughs> and I'd like to know uh, if that's true or not, but uh, how much does the administrator of Medicare make? You know, it's my. Uh, they're, they have uh, similar responsibilities and duties, I would think, you know. Yeah, so I do not know how much Seema Verma makes. She is the administrator of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, but I know there are federal caps on salaries and reimbursement for political appointees as well as federal um, general service employees. I think that when we look at the overhead of salaries within the healthcare system. That is a part of the more robust conversation we're having as a country about where do our healthcare dollars go. Um, but they're shareholders, right? It's a publicly traded company and so there's a value that some, that that is where the shareholders have decided is there. That, that, is, a, that is a national, I mean, you wanna talk about the national conversation around Medicare for all, this is sort of the crux of it, is where do our healthcare dollars go and how are they spent and who controls those levers? And 
wherever we end will be a uniquely American solution, and we have built a healthcare system on the private sector, and this, these are what we see in it. We have a question over here. Um, yes. Um, hello. <laughs> I'm Esteban Rivas. I'm a family medicine resident. My question was, uh, since we're talking about uh, prescription drug affordability, um, my question was about the 340B pharmacies, and I don't know if there's any um, anything in the pipeline with the new Congress about any legislation to expand and protect those programs. And I know Pfizer is uh, a member of Pharma, and I'm, um, I was just wondering if there's any um, kind of like anything from, from Pfizer to kind of guide Pharma, because Pharma is a lobby that's against 340B pharmacies. So I was just wondering if there's any conversation about that. Um, so I'm not quite sure I, I understood your question, but you had a, had a question in regards to how pharma is setting their policy and the role that Pfizer pay, plays in. in? Um, so it was a, it was a two part question. My my first question was like if there's any anything in the pipeline for any kind of um, um, legislation or anything for 340B protections, and also I guess the the role with Pfizer and pharma and how that kind of um, guides I guess their lobbying. Um, efforts against 340B. Do you want me to take the 340B question? Yes. I'll start with the, with the 340B question. I'll start with the policy question 340B. Yes. So the 340B program provides pharmaceuticals at lower costs mm -hmm. to hospitals and other facilities that have a disproportionate share of Medicaid and other low income um, patients. And that is to help them offset the expensive mm -hmm. cost of drugs for populations where medical reimbursement is often very low. And Medicaid has a formula for drug pricing. The 340B program is an important access issue. I think the challenge that, and it is, it is a place right now where there's a robust debate. It's been a robust mm -hmm. debate in the past two years because some hospitals have used 340B pricing across all of their patient population and not just their low income and sort of what we would call low-income subsidy populations in Medicare, but they're Medicaid and LIS populations, and other people have managed the program differently and sort of spread that save the, the lower drug costs to help them address costs across the hospital. So there's an invest there is a, let me say investigation because that's the wrong word, that we are looking at 340B. We think that 340B and affordability, especially for our central hospitals, is very important. Um, but there are concerns about how it is being used um, if it is being used in the way the program was intended. The administration right now has put a big target on it and just wants to get rid of it, but they're also really mad at the hospitals right now because the hospitals were supportive of not repealing the Affordable Care Act. So that is a political fight that's right. sort of fun to sit in my seat and watch and be like, okay, so you're going to go after blue states and hospitals and academic medical centers in a way that is harmful to patients, and is that the right thing? That is definitely Melanie Gorin's political pr perspective and not... And then from the Pfizer perspective around the 340B program, we're very supportive of that, as is pharma. So we've been on the side of, uh, you know, maintaining the 340B and expanding the 340B. So I think if you look at any statements from the pharmaceutical in industry, we've been supportive of that. Next question over here. My name is uh, Robert Limbo. I'm from the National Institutes of Health. Disclaimer, I'm not speaking on behalf of Department of <laughs> Health and Human Services or my agency, uh, but as a physician, and I wanted to ask uh, uh, the panel, probably Melanie. Uh, as you know, the expansion of graduates now from allopathic and osteopathic medical schools um, is seen as salutary. However, the problem is at the training end in terms of the cap on positions that are available funded through Medicare. And um, this is um, becoming a, a more and more important issue. And I'm just wondering whether the cap, expanding the cap, but uh, thinking about maybe alternative approaches, is on the radar screen of Congress? And if so, what are you all thinking about? So expanding the cap has been on our radar for a long time. Um, Joe Crowley had a bill in the last Congress. Mm -hmm. I believe. Um, Terry Sewell from Alabama is picking up the bill this Congress, as Mr. Carly retired, to lift the cap. We actually lifted the cap in a really small way, but just go with me, like any victory at this point is a victory, um, around substance use disorder last year as part of H.R. 6, which was the larger opioid package that passed out of Congress and was signed by the President. Um, we recognize physician shortages and health professional shortages. Um, 
And you know, as you are aware, as some of you in the room may be aware, we asked IOM, the Institute of Medicine, which is now the National Academy of Medicine, to look at this and come forward with recommendations. And we are still so figuring out which pathway is best. But there is legislation before the Ways and Means Committee about lifting the cap. The big barrier is how expensive it is. And in a period where the rules of Congress say that when we spend money in mandatory programs, we have to pay for it, that bec it becomes a question of, do I cut something that is benefiting Americans now for something we know we're going to need down the road? Um, and as anybody who's ever had to like balance their checkbook and make those decisions, those are painful. They're even more painful when you apply them to the country. And you want to be very, we're, we're being very, very thoughtful about what we refer to as pay fors. Thank you. And a, and a question here? I'm, my name is Pascal Enkleric. I work for a company called GenFit, which is a small biotech working on development of therapy for fatty liver disease and diagnostic for fatty liver disease. And I have two questions, if I may. From uh, the industry side, uh, we hear oftentimes patients who change jobs, they change health insurance, their new insurance requires them to go through the stem step therapy that they've done before, delaying really the treatment for patients. So is there anything that's currently included in some of the legislation that you've talked about to get rid of those requirements because it's absurd to delay access uh, to treatment. And the second question is on the payer side. Uh, we have a phase three uh, ending soon. We're gonna have conversation with payer. We're working on a chronic disease that's mostly asymptomatic for a very long time. And so we know what payers are gonna say. They're gonna say, why should we reimburse a drug that for, to treat patients that don't feel any symptoms for a long time. And so how do we limit the power of payer and what and the access of treatment for patients, especially for chronic disease that are part of like preventative medicine but are really important for the long term outcome of patients? So I'm gonna answer the first one because it's a lot easier, which is we've had discussions, we do not yet have legislation around if you are already undergoing treatment or diagnostics and you switch providers, how do you have a continuity of care? We know it is an issue. Um, it's also an issue around just affordability and deduct, right? Like if you change health insurance, then your deductible starts again. So like there's that barrier too. And we are aware of it and it's part and parcel of the same conversation around continuity of care. In terms of paying for pharmaceuticals or other treatments that have a large societal benefit, that is a robust conversation that Congress is having and congressional staff are having. Things like Sivaldi and treatment for, you know, it came on and it's um, sort of stir pharmaceuticals and having a debate about what is society's role. We're having this around CAR-T therapy, right, and other one-time protein therapies. What do you do when a therapy comes online that can cure sickle cell through a protein therapy? Where in the pipeline of payers does that go? Um, we, it, there are lots of models out there and we're still debating it because it doesn't fit within our current payer structure. Um, from the pharmaceutical world, there's some really interesting mm -hmm. ideas around risk bearing and going- Value-based sort of, pricing. Value-based pricing mm -hmm. and risk bearing and some other thoughts. Um, there's an idea around what happens in hospitals where we talk about outlier payments. Do we create a national outlier payer pool? Mm -hmm. Where does that money come from if we think that's a great idea? So there's, we are thrilled by innovation and we are thrilled by the fact that there are the ability to prevent the onset of disease or treat disease in a way that is truly innovative and want, happens once. How do we address it as a society from a financial perspective is a question that we are all struggling with. So to the answer your first question, um, there's been a lot of advocates have, who have gotten together and they're going state by state to institute what we call step therapy reform. So Oklahoma just passed step therapy reform, Georgia just passed step therapy uh, reform, Virginia. So I, would, I can get you a list of the states that have passed that, and basically it says that if you have already gotten prior approval for the medication, even if you change your health plan, you will continue to get that medication without having to go back and step to go through the steps again. So it's not passing all of the states, but it's passing, I think, 19, between 19 and 25 states. So I would love to share that information with you and we can get maybe a coalition in your state if they haven't passed it. But it's definitely being pushed by the advocates across the country. 
So I, I just want to ask, a, we're going to wrap up here, but I just want to ask a question I think that all of us uh, have been more and more uh, seeing on the news about immigrants and our uh, immigrants from Latin America and the important role of government in not only uh, uh, analyzing the situation and placement and all that, but we have a real big role uh, that has been looked at in terms of health. And is there any health care legislation that is being discussed about HHS's, uh, you know, uh, role or the you know, Homeland Security role? I mean, you may not have jurisdiction over this, but in, from the pharma perspective, from from the dental perspective, from the Congress perspective, it, I think it's important that we know what, what we should be talking about to our, uh, uh, to our congressmen and senators to help them understand that we are concerned. So there's a lot of oversight going on. Mm -hmm. um, there's oversight that is happening from the Energy and Commerce Committee. There's oversight that is happening from the, oversight and, the Committee on Oversight and Reform looking at HHS and their roles. I think the bigger conversation that I hope you will have with your elected representatives is the impact of the public charge role on access to care. The stories that we have heard of people pulling their out, children out of the children's health insurance program, of not wanting to receive Medicaid, of not wanting to even apply if they are eligible for advanced premium tax credits, which is crazy, or Medicare or Social Security for fear that it will have implications under the public charge rule and what is happening with, their, with families' abilities to bring loved ones to the country or to apply for um, citizenship or immigration status for family members living in the country is having a detrimental effect not just on people's lives but also on the financial stability of many of our essential hospitals um, and our providers. So anything that creates a barrier to care is something you should be talking about because that is what is the most harmful. This threat that mm -hmm. makes people not want to receive the services that they have earned and are entitled to. Thank you. And I would just conclude to say vote. Vote <laughs> for the people who support your policies. Vote for people who support um, um, access to care. Uh, because that's that's why we are here where we are now. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I said. But you know, like but I could add a dental component of it. Uh, I, I live in a border state, uh, Texas, and uh, I mentioned earlier these missions of mercy. Uh, we've had them in El Paso. We've had them in Laredo. I volunteered in, in all of those. We don't look at anybody's, uh, you know, uh, where they live, or uh, we just we we try to have a, a servant's heart. And serve, and I know that my colleagues that are dentists on the border, uh, they treat uh, the, the Medicaid system in Texas, early periodic screening, diagnosis, and yeah. treatment. Title 19, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it is robust uh, in the Valley and in El Paso. We have many, 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 many providers because we have a decent reimbursement rate as far as where we rank in Texas, mm -hmm. one through 50 as far as the reimbursement rate. We're about 20. Uh, because uh, of a legislation that took place a few years ago. So therefore, there's lots of dentists that are providing mm -hmm. care uh, for, uh, for Hispanic patients and, and other uh, underserved populations. And, and I'm proud of our state for that. And Thank you. Know, Pfizer doesn't check immigration status for our yeah. drug donation. Yeah, you programs. mentioned that earlier. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that we have to give our panel a great big round of applause. And please give us your thoughts uh, for next year's conference, future conferences, by filling out evaluation forms. Uh, thank you very much for being here and uh, learning about policies that affect all of us. And we hope you get more involved in health policy in your career. And NHMA and the HDA, I want to speak on behalf of both of us. We understand our roles as leaders, and, and that's where we need to be at the forefront of helping our policymakers with our policies. So thank you very much for being here.